nothing will make you feel short more than consistently climbing statically. In that kind of position, you're gonna lose engagement of, of a lot of helpful shoulder stability muscles. When you see people starting to moonboard, uh, they'll jump to things with too straight of an arm, which is extremely difficult to control. You have more torque and less ability to control it. really impressed the speed and sort of like conviction with which she generates. I like that everything starts from like a straight arm generation. A common mistake that people end up with is starting to get kind of bent in for control and then trying to like generate from here. But everything she does is just kind of like out, set, rip, jump. Like basically every move, she goes from a high foot to like a full extension, you know? So she's very comfortable generating out of these bunch positions like you pointed out. And so that actually just brings me back to like sort of a, a typical PSA for shorter climbers in general. Um, and to some extent, newer climbers across the board is it's easier to do things with momentum. It's easier to do things with momentum. It's easier to do things with momentum. You know, like Wait, <laughs> you what? get this idea <laughs> that somehow like powerful climbing is for the big, strong, muscly types, that it's uh, jerky or injurious. You know, you have a lot of like the sense of like the shirtless bro in the gym, like dining around between stuff. And that's like what dynamic climbing is. But in general, if you have to get to full span, it's immensely easier to do with momentum. You know, it's like, it's just utilizing a bit of speed and trying to get as many different parts of your body as possible to generate the movement rather than just trying to like lock it on a hold. So if you're shorter or if you're just doing big moves, it's immensely difficult to lock off those moves and do them statically, you know? And so nothing will make you feel short more than consistently climbing statically. If I try to like lock something off and reach, you're like, man, that's a mile away. But if you take advantage of just being able to like lurch across to it, um, much easier and you can get much, much further. If you come off a climb and you're like, ooh, you know, why does my upper trap, my neck hurt? You, you, that, that's one of those reasons. <laughs> um, little lacking in some of the mid-back engagement. The rotator cuff seems to be engaged a bit where you can see the infraspinate of some, but definitely lacking in some of the- That's the one you want. Yeah, yeah. let's go with this color. The, like the lower trap, like that's what we're kind of looking for. You can kind of see it a little more on this, the right side, um, maybe the lighting a little bit, but really you can kind of tell from if you're looking in that area, there's, there's not a lot of like mid or low trap or rhomboid engagement to help stabilize this, this scapula. So definitely worthwhile training the, the mid back with either, you know, the, the, the face pull exercise or just Oops. making your pull ups a little bit wider to gain that strength or, you know, inverted rows, something like that to work yeah. on that strength. I just spotted this as kind of like an unusual sort of spine position. He does it a little bit at the beginning here as well as on the last move. Um, and I think it's really kind of cool how it lets him sort of like sneak and maneuver around to uh, take better advantage of these holds. But um, it doesn't really support his neck, like his body doesn't go with his head, which is partially what produces that kind of whiplash there. Um, anyways, the way that I would normally see this done is staying kind of like more extended on that right hand so that you're pulling kind of through the undercling in this direction. And so that would carry him relatively straight through the back, like up this way. And then you would, from that position, come into this cross. So you'd be kind of like this. Like you can imagine how if you were just a little further over to the left, that would kind of take you smoothly into that, into the, uh, the left hand. But at the same time, you see people like uh, Yanni Garnbray and some top climbers really taking advantage of these kind of scorpion positions and twisting into things. This is actually kind of an important point because people, there's a couple things that people kind of classically err on with moon kicks. One is to drive just with the leg and not really with the hips, which is largely what's happening here. But also he doesn't really carry through 
with the leg completely. This is more yeah. like a knee lead. Two really simple, straightforward uh, cues for moon kicks in general, and they don't always have to be totally extravagant. You want to kind of balance it with the amount of movement that you're trying to get. But one is that you should essentially initiate with a back flag. So you see how he kind of starts to here, mm -hmm. but you want to have your leg kind of like, mm, kind of like this, you know. So like really reach back. You should feel it sort of through your uh, like obliques and kind of across the body. The general feeling of it should be like um, really casting back, like for a huge shot, like soccer kick. So to some extent, using like your whole leg lets you kind of steer and direct things a lot more. And when you use just sort of a knee, it's a lot more kind of quick and jerky. So a little less control, a little less power. I want to say like how helpful like that frog pose is for stuff like this because mm -hmm. if you're not mobile enough, it's gonna just push you further away. Yeah. Whereas if you have good mobility, it allows you to stay a little bit closer, so you'll be able to drive through those feet a little bit better. Frequently, when you see people starting to moonboard, uh, they'll jump to things with too straight of an arm, which is extremely difficult to control. You have more torque and less ability to control it. Um, so jumping into that with a bad arm is good. Left shoulder is a little bit elevated, which isn't ideal, but he sticks this and then he immediately looks down at his foot, which is also quite good. Good kind of precision and tension setting up there. Um, don't love seeing the generation out of bent arm. Um, as it turns out, still fine. He hits it smoothly, not a lot of excess momentum. But this is exactly the opposite of what we saw with the, the shorter girl. Uh, Beth. Beth. Bethany. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Bethany. Broadly speaking, the longer you have to accelerate, kind of the faster and more power you can get and the less sort of like maximal effort it takes to achieve that because you simply have more time to accelerate. The shoulder is coming way up towards his ear and in that kind of position you're going to lose engagement of, of a lot of helpful shoulder stability muscles. Yeah. Without that engagement, that shoulder rolls, rolls you forward into like basically a mechanically disadvantaged position. Yeah, everything else aside, you just lose so much strength in those positions. It's like once you end up in, a, in an overhead here, it's like you just kind of have like posterior deltoid, like that's kind of it. Just sort of pulling up and down here and then just feeling like this and trying to pull up and down, like not only is it kind of pinchy and stretchy sort of throughout, but you can just feel things like kind of not engaged, you know? Mm -hmm. Not all of these positions like in a one-off are gonna be like this dangerous thing, but yeah. if it just happens over and over again, that's when I see people who are like, yeah, I started having shoulder pain. There wasn't any one specific moment. Mm -hmm. So training that awareness for one is important, but just creating those positions and working on your engagement by trying to engage that lower trap and keeping that down and back rather than allowing it to mm -hmm. shrug up and forward and compensate through like the upper trap is a good drill, whether you're doing it with an isolated single arm Y drill yeah. or like two arms or a face pull into an overhead press, or just when you're warming up, mm -hmm. like shooting for a hold and then... And just kind of feeling that tension all the way through. Exactly. It's convenient that the things that are somewhat injurious are also basically never mechanically advantageous, you know? So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know... And, and I think that's why like, when I help people with shoulder injuries, they feel stronger with their climbing afterward. It's because it's not just the recovering from the injury, it's that yeah. they're learning to be in more biomechanically sound positions. Yeah. So their shoulder just feels stronger and able to generate more force. Exactly. Win-win. Along those lines, um, I have a couple of uh, like sort of warm-up routines that I like, and clients will sometimes like, they'll be all like three sessions in, you know, and be like, oh, I feel so much stronger. Which is great, but that's just not nearly enough time for like a physiological yeah. adaptation or even in many cases, like much of a neural adaptation. So I think it's literally just, like you said, like learning how to generate from stronger positions and that can be done very quickly. 
Great. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And as always, of course, thank you to Dan. If if you want to get some personalized information and obviously climb a lot better, he is available for coaching, and that information will be available in the description.